the Lord. Those two songs talk about how we're blessed in Christ. He's the fountain of every blessing, and He ought to be our... Well, look, He's not part of our life. He is our life, and we need to act that way in our daily walk. Sometimes we let the things of this world distract us from the most important thing, and that's our relationship with, with God. That's eternal. Things of this world fade away. All right, we're going to start again in 1 Corinthians 3 as we continue our series on the judgment seat of Christ. And in our last two messages, we focused on exactly what it is we'll give an account for at the judgment seat of Christ. We saw that the issue will be the quality of our work and that our work is the people we minister to with the gospel of the grace of God and the truth of God's word rightly divided. Uh, the work of the ministry is about evangelism and edification. God will have all men to be saved, that's evangelism, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, uh, that's edification. When we get saved, that's just the beginning of a new life in Christ, and though we're complete in Him the moment we believe, practically speaking, we need to be built up in the faith, learning, you know, I've often said it this way, it takes just a moment to, to receive the Lord, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, but the rest of your life you can grow in the knowledge of what God did for you when He saved you, to be edified as to who you are in the body of Christ. Now, those who sincerely and faithfully follow the Apostle Paul as the wise master builder, again, in 1 Corinthians 3, he said that he was the wise master builder according to the grace God gave him to lay the foundation. The foundation is Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. As the master builder, he has the divine blueprints as to how to do the work of the ministry in the age of grace. And that's why he says in 1 Corinthians twice, he says, follow me. Not him as a man, but follow what the Lord revealed through him to us to do in this age. And if we sincerely and faithfully follow the Apostle Paul as far as what the Lord revealed through him for us to do today, uh, we're going to receive a reward. And that's going to be our focus today, what it means to receive a reward at the judgment seat of Christ. And then, Lord willing, next week we'll talk about what it means to suffer loss. Look again in 1 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse number 10. Uh, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation... And another buildeth thereon. So the foundation of this present age has been laid. And that's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation, the mystery, Romans 16, 25. So the foundation's been laid. Now we better, you know, as we build on that foundation, he said, let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. There are a lot of people out there that are trying to do the work of the ministry. The question is, how are we building on the, on the foundation? By the way, there are some people, they don't even have the right foundation. Uh, it may be Jesus Christ, but it may be Jesus Christ according to prophecy concerning His kingdom on the earth and the nation Israel, and they're trying to build on that foundation. That's not the foundation for this age. The foundation for this age is Jesus Christ, yes, but it's according to the revelation of the mystery, which has to do with Him being the head of one body. And in that body, there's neither Jew or Gentile. So it's not Christ as the king of the Jews over the Gentiles. It's Christ as the head of the body, wherein there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Okay, so make sure you, 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 you know what the foundation is, and then you better take heed. It's not enough just to know the foundation. How are you building on the foundation, right? That's the question. Let every man take heed how. He built it thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, and that's got to do with the quality of the work that God would have us do today, wood, hay, stubble, that would have to do with activity, religious activity, but it being of the flesh and not according to God's word rightly divided, Every man's work shall be made manifest, 
For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work. Not himself, but his work. Our sins were already judged on the cross, but God's going to judge our work. And the fire is going to manifest. If our work remains, it was the quality he was looking for. But if it's wood, hay, and stubble, if you know anything about fire, you know that if fire gets on wood, hay, and stubble, it's not going to last very long. It's going to burn up. But what does a fire do to gold, silver, and precious stones? It only purifies it. It doesn't destroy it. It only purifies it. So it says, The day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Not just the quantity. He didn't say how much it is. Hey, you could be very busy doing the wrong thing. I mean, you can work hard serving, you think, the Lord, but if you're not doing it by His Word and His will for His glory, it's wasted. It's not just what you do, it's why you do it, the motive, how you do it, doing it in the Spirit of God, you know, not in your flesh, and according to the Word of God, rightly divided. we got to rightly divide the Word of God to understand the will of God for the age in which we're living. He said, what sort it is. Now, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, here's the promise, he shall receive a reward. Alright, so if your work was gold, silver, precious stones, obviously it's going to abide that day when your work is made manifest of what sort it is, and you'll be rewarded for that work. If any man's work shall be burned... That would be the wood, hay, stubble. He shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved. Once you're saved, you're always saved. You have eternal salvation in the body of Christ. Nothing can change that. Yet, it's possible to be saved and suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. He himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. The fire burns up his work, but not him. <laughs> And, uh, but his, his work goes up in smoke, and there's nothing that remains. He's not going to be rewarded for that. And we'll talk more about that next time. But today we're focusing in on this thing of he shall receive a reward. Um, let me try to set the stage somewhat for where we're going. The central theme of the Bible is actually not you. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Okay. And the modern church, that's what people think. No, the central theme of the Bible is the king and his kingdom. The Bible is Christocentric. It reveals Christ. It's about Christ. Well, Christ is an, is an eternal king, and he has a great purpose concerning his kingdom, and that's really the bulk of what the Scripture has to do with. And God has a twofold purpose concerning his kingdom. It's implied in the first verse of your Bible, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So, He has a purpose concerning the heaven. He has a purpose concerning the earth. His purpose concerning the heaven is a mystery that was revealed through Paul's ministry. But His purpose concerning the earth, that's been spoken of uh, since the world began from the beginning. Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied of the second coming and setting up of the kingdom on the earth. Look please in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Now I have a message online where we kind of deal with this in more detail when we talk about the twofold purpose of God. So I won't be able to get into too much depth on this because that's not really the message today. But if we're going to talk about reward... We need to understand and put this in context of the difference between reward in the earthly kingdom and the heavenly kingdom. Now, Ephesians 1, verse 8. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. 
So the mystery of this present age and what God is doing today is a great illustration of His wisdom. Paul called it the hidden wisdom of God. It's something God planned before the world began but kept secret. It's not plan B. God doesn't need a plan B. God knew what was going to happen concerning Israel, and that's okay because He had purposed to reveal something new concerning uh, the heavens, concerning the body of Christ. Well, He said, having made known unto us the church, the body of Christ, the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself. Now, He had revealed already His will concerning the earth, but there's a mystery of His will, something that He had purposed in Himself, but was kept secret. Uh, for an example, you don't have to turn there, but let me give you a 2 Timothy 1.9 where Paul said, "...who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began." Now His purpose concerning the earth was revealed since the world began, and it was prophesied since the world began. But He had a secret purpose concerning the heavens that He purposed in Himself and kept it a secret till he revealed it through his chosen vessel, the Apostle Paul. So he talks about the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Let me stop here and say, there are people out there who will get up and say, I don't even believe in dispensations. What are you going to do with that? I mean, he says, the dispensation of the fullness of times. A dispensation is a dispensing a dealing out, an economy of God, how God deals with man. God doesn't change. He certainly does change as He reveals more things progressively. He changes in His dealings with man. And there's coming a dispensation, the fullness of times that hasn't happened yet. It's going to be in the future. I believe it's the eternal state when God's purpose for the times comes to the full, comes to fruition. That in the dispensation, the fullness of times... And Paul uses the word dispensation four times. He's the only one that uses it. And the reason why I'm a dispensationalist is because God is. He wrote it in his book. And you, got, you can't understand your Bible if you don't understand the dispensations God revealed in his Bible. That in the dispensation, the fullness of times, he might gather together in one. Okay, it's all... Look, Jesus Christ is central to everything God does. So whether you're talking about the earthly kingdom or the heavenly kingdom, Christ is the king. Uh, God's glorified through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's really the great purpose is the glory of God through Jesus Christ. But it's fulfilled in a twofold manner, a twofold plan concerning heaven and earth. But He's going to gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. So he's got a plan for things in heaven. He's got a plan for things in earth. Now it's all gathered in him, ultimately. But there's still a difference between heaven and earth. In the end, when it's all said and done, in eternity, there's one family of God. But there's different members of that household. There's going to be a difference between the nation Israel reigning on the earth over Gentile nations and the church, the body of Christ. That's neither Jew nor Gentile. These are different things. It, yeah, it's all gathered in Christ, but in the family of God, there's still a difference between heaven and earth. And Paul said, for an example, in Ephesians 3, in verse 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Okay? So, in eternity, all who are redeemed and are in eternity with the Lord, are in Christ. But there's still a distinction between the nation Israel, Gentile nations, and the body of Christ. Okay? He said, in whom, verse 11, also we have obtained an inheritance. So, you know, God promised Israel an inheritance on the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. That's what Jesus said to Israel in His ministry to them. The meek shall inherit the earth. Nowhere. Nowhere does the Apostle Paul speaking to the church, the body of Christ, say we're going to inherit the earth. He always mentions our heavenly hope 
and that we're in heavenly places. So there is an earthly inheritance that's already been revealed, but now here's a mystery of His will where God, look, we today know God's purpose for the earth, but we also know His purpose for the heavenly places. It's all been revealed to us. So we have an, obtained an inheritance. Being predestinated, in other words, our destiny is already determined in, look, don't let that word scare you. When you get saved in the body of Christ, there is a predestination that the body of Christ is going to reign with Christ in heavenly places and be glorified in His image. That word does not mean that God set some people aside and says, you're going to hell no matter what, and you're going to heaven no matter what. That's not in the Bible. That's theology of man. That's not sound doctrine of the Word of God. You can't show me one verse. Somebody say, well, the Bible said, Esau, uh, Jacob, have I loved Esau, have I hated? He said that after they were born. And he, did, he said, uh, Jacob, have I loved Esau, have I hated? He didn't say, Jacob, have I predestinated to heaven, and Esau, I predestinated to hell. It's not what he said. And there's a context to why he said that. But nonetheless, I, I need to get back to the point here. Verse 11, whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So we know God's will for the earth, but we also know his will for, for heaven because it's all been revealed now in the Word of God. The Word of God is complete. And his purpose for the heaven was something that he kept secret and it was revealed through the Apostle Paul. Now listen, the government of both heaven and earth must be reconciled to the Lord's full control because there's been a rebellion in both. There was a rebellion in heaven before Adam fell. Lucifer fell before Adam. Else how does he come as the serpent in the garden? There was a rebellion among the angels led by Lucifer before the world began. The world as in mankind. As in when God created Adam. So there was a rebellion in heaven and, of course, that rebellion came to the earth. God set Adam on the earth with dominion. Satan coveted that. He usurped that dominion by getting man to fall. And, of course, man was responsible. The devil couldn't make Adam do it. Adam chose to do what he did when he disobeyed the Lord. But when God revealed he was putting his king on the earth, Adam... And he was going to bring his kingdom to the earth. The devil did everything he could to take over that and to hijack that. And that has been the devil's focus. Now, look please in Colossians 1. Beginning in verse 12. I'm going to try to go somewhere with all this. I'm just trying to set the table a little bit. I'm not doing this any justice. I wish I could say more, but I'm just putting this out there to remind you of some things. Again, we have other studies available where we go into this in more depth. But I'm trying to get to the rewards, and I'll not get there if I get hung up on this. I'm just trying to, like I said, set the table. So Colossians 1 verse 12, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us, the church, the body of Christ, meet to be partakers... And we, we weren't meat for it. He made us meat, okay, because put, because we're in the body of Christ. Now we're meat to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Spiritually speaking, the moment you believe on Christ, you're taken out of Satan's kingdom, and you are spiritually in uh, God's kingdom. Okay, in the eternal spiritual sense of the word. Paul's not talking about a kingdom on the earth here. That will come. But he's talking about a heavenly kingdom. All right. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, which means Jesus Christ is God because He is the visible image of the invisible God. In Colossians 2.9 it says He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If He's the fullness of the Godhead, He's God. Okay, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now, 
So-called Jehovah's Witnesses like to come in this verse. They ignore the first part of it. They, of course, ignore the verse that follows it. And they focus in on the firstborn of every creature and try to teach that Jesus Christ is a creature. That's not at all what Paul's saying. He's the firstborn. He has a position of authority over every creature. You want to know why? Because he is the creator. And if he's the creator, he can't be a creature. The next verse says, For by him were all things created. Therefore, Paul can't be saying Jesus is a creature. Okay? He is God. For by Him were all things created. Now notice, that are in heaven and that are in earth. Now what's he talking about in particular here? Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers... All things were created by Him and for Him. We can look at the world today and we see thrones and we see dominions and we see principalities and it's all under Satan right now in this world. He's the prince of this world. He has the kingdoms of this world. But there's also an invisible realm to us where there is likewise thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. And all this was created by Christ and for Christ. The problem is there's rebellion in both. Both have to be brought back and reconciled fully to His control and dominion. Notice what He said. He's before all things, and by Him all things consist. Good night. Doesn't that tell you He's God if He's before all things, and by Him all things consist? And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. Well, only God deserves preeminence, and Jesus gets it because He's God. Notice, it, For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of His cross. Let me just stop and say this. I hear people sometimes, they say, Well, I'm going to make my peace with God one of these days. You know, I'm going to go get baptized and make my peace with God. You know, I'm going to start doing right. <laughs> yeah, right. How many people are going to start doing right? You know, they never get around to it, do they? You know what? You don't, I got good news for you. You don't have to make peace with God. It's already been made by the blood of Jesus Christ. He's already made reconciliation possible if you will simply receive Him. It's by the blood of, it's already been done. To get saved, quit trying to get saved and trust Christ and you will be saved. That's the gospel. It's done. It's finished. He died for all of your sins, was buried and rose again. It's all been settled. All you need to do is come to God as a lost sinner and believe on Christ and trust Him and you're saved by grace through faith. And when you get saved, what an amazing salvation He's given us. Paul's talking about that in this passage about how we are in the kingdom of His dear Son and what we have in Him. But notice what he says, having made peace through the blood of His cross by Him, by Him, He's central to it all, to reconcile all things unto Himself. He didn't say all beings. Now there are some people that teach that in the end, everybody who's ever lived will be saved and even the devil will be saved in the end. Universal reconciliation. That's a heresy. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible tells us that Satan's going to burn forever and ever in the lake of fire. And so are those people who followed him. There will be lost souls tormented in the lake of fire forever and ever, according to the Word of God. I don't, look, I don't enjoy saying that, but that's the truth. He did not say he's going to reconcile all beings. He said reconcile all things unto himself. What things? Context will tell you, verse 16, For by Him were all things created, that are in heaven, that are in earth. What things? Visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions and so on. He's going to reconcile the thrones, dominions, principalities, all of that fully back to Himself through Jesus Christ. He said, By Him I say, whether it be things where? In earth or things in heaven. You know, this is good stuff. I almost can't contain myself. I start thinking along these lines. You think about it. Look. <laughs> and I, I always, one thing about it, you know, it's like you have something in your mind and in your heart, but how to express it sometimes is not always easy. <laughs> but I hope you see this. And if you see this, you'll be joyful today. You won't sit there with a bad attitude. 
Because you'll care about God's glory and God's purpose and God's... Co- if you came here for yourself, that's what your problem is. If you came to study the Word of God and see what His purpose and plan is, you'll get something out of this. He said that He's going to reconcile the things in earth or things in heaven. Now, when it comes to things in the earth, that's got to do with His program for Israel. But the heavens, that's where we come in, Okay. Now, let me just say, in Philippians 2, verse 10, he said, one day every knee will bow. He said, of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. But they're not going to be saved. The things under the earth, look, at the great white throne, the lost will bow the knee and confess Jesus Christ as Lord, but they're going to be cast in the lake of fire, according to Revelation chapter 20. Did you notice here when he said, reconcile all things, he didn't say under the earth? He just said things in heaven and earth, and he's talking about in the context, principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, and so forth. Now, the prophetic program of Israel, and that is what the bulk of the Scripture reveals and deals with, has to do with the Lord's purpose to establish His kingdom on the earth. And I can give you verse after verse on that. But the mystery program of the body of Christ, that was something... That was hidden till it was first. And where was it hidden, by the way? In God. Ephesians 3 said it was hidden God. Not hidden the Old Testament, it was hidden God. And he first revealed it through the Apostle Paul. And I know that because that's what the Bible says in Ephesians 3 for an example and other places. Now, the mystery program of the body of Christ has to do with the Lord's purpose to replace Satan and his angels. Who began, that rebellion began where? Before the world began, in the heavens. There was a cosmic rebellion. And Satan, you know, he's called the prince of the power of the air. It said there is spiritual wickedness in high places. In Ephesians 6. Look please in Revelation chapter 12. Now in Revelation 12 we are in the 70th week of Daniel. Commonly called the seven years of tribulation. And we're right in the middle of it in Revelation 12. And notice what happens. Verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. That would be the devil. And the dragon fought and his angels. And prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. That's future. You know what that tells you? Right now they have a place in heaven. I'm not talking about the third heaven where God's throne is. But my friend, there are three heavens. And the first heaven has to do with our atmosphere. The second heaven has to do with space. And the third heaven has to do where God's throne is. And uh, they they have a place. That rebellion started before the world began. They've had that place. But they're going to lose that place. And there's going to be people ready to take those positions. Because at this point, we've already been caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And gave an account at the judgment seat of Christ. And been given our reward as to where we're going to reign with Christ in heavenly places so that midway through the 70th week when the devil's kicked out of heaven, we're ready to step in. Because we were caught up before the 70th week began. We've already been to the judgment seat of Christ. And now we're ready to step right into those positions. God has got to replace the devil and his angels that have a place in heaven when it comes to principalities, powers, dominions, and so forth. Now, Here's the thing. Satan deceived himself. He's a great deceiver, all right. He's so good at it, he deceived himself. He thought having Jesus crucified would defeat God's purpose for the earth. Christ came to set up His kingdom on the earth. That's what He preached. He taught His disciples to pray, Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He was preaching the promised kingdom to Israel, which is going to be set up on the earth. Verse after verse after verse makes that clear. And the devil's trying to fight that. That's where the focus is. 
That's what God had revealed. That's what God was doing. So that's what the, the devil was opposing. And so when he moved Israel to crucify their Messiah, he thought he really did a great thing. <laughs> he defeated himself. I, I get chill bumps when I think about the fact that God defeated the devil through the weakness of death. He came down as a man. He fasted 40 days and nights and let the devil give him his best shot. And it was no problem to the Lord. Oh my goodness, folks. You ought to get excited when you start thinking about the magnitude of what we're talking about here. And so the devil, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, that verse number 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world. Why did He ordain it before the world? Because there was a rebellion before the world. And God said, I'm going to replace these guys. I've got a purpose and a plan. This has happened, but I'm going to fix it. I'm going to reconcile these things back to myself. And so he had this purpose and plan before the world began. He said, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That proves dispensational truth. In other words, God progressively reveals things. He progressively begins dispensations. The Bible is not one revelation given at one time. It was given progressively. And God kept His purpose for the heaven a secret. The devil was focused on defeating God's purpose for the earth. And what he did to try to defeat God's purpose for the earth revealed a whole new purpose concerning the heaven. But not only that, it even gives salvation to Israel to come on the earth. Because the blood of Christ is, is how all things are redeemed, whether things in heaven or things in earth. Whether you're talking about Israel or the body of Christ. And, you know, I always think about how Pharaoh was trying to be so wise in how he attacked the Hebrews and had those babies killed trying to keep the people down and defeat the people. But because of what he did in having those babies killed... It was that very thing that caused Moses to wind up being brought up in his own house to lead the people out of Egypt. Okay? And, and so, again, God takes the wise and their own craftiness. You can't defeat the purpose of God. God's so sovereign, He can give man a free will, He can give the devil a free will, and He still wins. He's not a puppet master making the devil do something or making man do something. He knows the end from the beginning and he says, go ahead, devil, have, have your way. Do what you want to do. We'll see who's going to win in the end. Well, we know who does. God is all wise and all powerful and the devil, as smart as he is and as wise as he is and as powerful as he is, is nothing compared to the Lord God Almighty. And so there is going to be a kingdom established both in heaven and earth. Now, God reigns in the heavens already. I'm just saying it's not fully. Look, there's an issue there. There's rebellion there. The devil is there. Okay? That has to be reconciled. Now, both Israel and the body of Christ are going to be judged and rewarded. But our judgments will occur at different times. And our rewards will differ as to the sphere in which we will enjoy them. All right? Israel. Look in Matthew 16. Matthew 16. See, I'm doing this because when it comes to this issue of the judgment and the rewards, a lot of people confound all these passages together and you've got to rightly divide them. Because our judgment will take place before the 70th week of Daniel. And God's judgment on Israel is the 70th week and what's going to happen at the end of it when He comes to set up His kingdom. And the difference in what's going to happen is very clear uh, in Matthew 16, verse 24. Then said Jesus unto His disciples, If any man will come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. Now, cross means death. 
He said, you're going to have to be martyrs for me. Because there's going to be an Antichrist that if they reject, they will be martyrs. If they don't take the mark of the beast, they're going to be beheaded. He said, don't worry about that. Take up your cross and follow me, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. He's saying, if you're willing to lay down your life for my sake, you're going to find it. You'll be resurrected. You'll reign. But if you deny me, so you can have your life now, and to, you can't buy or sell in the world system without the mark of the beast when that comes. So he's saying, look, if you, if you try to gain the whole world, what, what is that going to matter if you lose your soul? Notice what he says. What is a man profited, verse 26, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In the light of the mark of the beast, that's the question. You're going to take the mark so you can buy, sell, and trade? What does that matter when you lose your soul? And if you take the mark of the beast, you're going to the lake of fire, period, according to the Word of God. You and I today don't have to worry about that because we won't be here for it. That's not our trouble. That's Jacob's trouble. Okay? Now, verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come, and he's talking about to the earth, in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. In the next chapter, he shows it to them. Peter, James, and John see Christ in his kingdom on the Mount of Transfiguration. So he's talking about his second coming to set up his kingdom. Then they're going to be rewarded according to their works. Quickly, Revelation 5. Uh, <clears throat> a couple things here real quick. Oh, I don't have time to do this any justice, but I want to show you. In Revela and Revelation is the culmination of and climax of the kingdom program of the nation Israel. That's what it's, 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 it's called a prophecy many times. And it, it is the fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the kingdom to be set up on the earth. Well, Revelation 5 verse 10 says, It has made us and our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, he's talking about these Jews that had been scattered among the nations, but they're gathered out. They're redeemed out, and they're going to be kings and priests on the earth. That God told Israel in Exodus 19 that His purpose for them was to make them a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, where the Gentile nations come to Him through them. He's talking about Israel in that verse. Now look in Revelation 20. Okay, when the Lord comes and sets up His kingdom at the second coming, notice what, what it says in verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now notice they had been martyrs. They took up their cross. They laid down their life. They would not take the mark of the beast. They're going to reign with Christ a thousand years and even beyond. But there is a thousand year reign and then a final battle with Satan and then eternity. Now, notice 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. So, for Israel, their judgment has to do with the 70th week of Daniel prophesied to come on them and the second coming when they'll be rewarded according to their works to reign with Christ on the earth for a thousand years. Okay? And there's many other verses I can give you. I just gave you a few. But notice what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4 verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Now notice, don't, don't fly over that. There is what? Laid up. Laid up where? In heaven. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. That day is the day of His appearing for the church, the body of Christ, because He says, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. He's going to catch us up to meet Him in the air. We're going to be taken up there, given account, and then we're going to be put in our positions to reign in heavenly places. That's not the same thing as Jesus coming back to the earth. 
to judge the nations and set his kingdom up over the earth through Israel. Those are different things. Now look at verse 18, 2 Timothy 4, 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his what? His heavenly kingdom. He's looking to get a crown of righteousness at the Lord's appearing to reign in his heavenly kingdom. Okay, so for Israel, the judgment has to do with the second coming. The rewards have to do with reigning on the earth. But for the body of Christ, our judgment will happen when we meet the Lord in the air in the mystery of our rapture. Look, the second coming is the, is the subject of prophecy. But our being caught up to meet the Lord in the air was a mystery. Paul said, I show you a mystery. This was not prophesied. He said, I say this to you by the word of the Lord. And when we're caught up, we're going to get a crown if we've been faithful to reign in His heavenly kingdom. Now, all of the body of Christ has an inheritance by virtue of our standing in Christ. In other words, if you're in the body of Christ, you are an heir of God. Romans 8. You're in the body of Christ. You're going to inherit all things with Christ as a joint heir with Christ. There is an inheritance for all members of the body of Christ according to many passages. But here's what I want you to understand. And the, the introduction was 35 minutes and the message will be five, hopefully. So, uh, sometimes you got to do it that way, though. It's a, so, the reward, a reward is not an inheritance. You know the difference? You get an inheritance based on uh, your being an heir, not because you earned anything, but a reward is earned, so to speak, and it's different from an inheritance. And Paul talked about in Colossians 3.24 the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. There is the inheritance and then there is the reward of of the inheritance. And let me tell you something. At the judgment seat of Christ, the bottom line is we're going to reap what we sowed. Now, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going to just fly over this because you're familiar with these passages. 1 Corinthians 3, some plant, we water, we plant, we water, but God gives the increase. He said, every man's going to receive according to his own labor. He's going to receive a reward according to his own labor. 1 Corinthians 3.8 And that labor is planning and watering, planning and watering. And that has to do with the gospel ministry and being a steward of the mysteries of God revealed to the Apostle Paul what God is doing in this age. Now I know this about, I know this about sowing and reaping. It's called the law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. And you reap more than you sow. <laughs> and you reap later than you sow. But you, you are going to reap. And Paul talked about this principle in 2 Corinthians 9 in the context of giving. This I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, you, you sow sparingly, then you reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. I mean, you're going to reap according to how you sow, and you're going to reap what you sow. Now look in Galatians 6. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I'm not done with this message, and we're not going to finish it. But that's the beauty of a series. Because we'll pick it up here next time. I'm gonna, what we're going to do, I'm going to just give you the, the, the um, preview. Lord willing, next week, instead of talking about the loss, we'll get to that. What we're going to focus, I'm going to take you to the passages in Paul's epistles where he talks about a crown. And we're going to look at those passages. That'll be the message next week. I just got hung up on some things here I couldn't get away from. That's just the way it is. You know, when something's in your heart, that's what you preach. I don't, I'm not a... Uh, uh, I, I, I took hermeneutics uh, in Bible college, but I don't even know what that is. All right. Look in um, Galatians 6. We're almost done. We're going to wrap this up because you can only take so much at one time, and I've already kind of given quite a bit, I think, of Scripture. 
Isn't it good, though, to get in the Word of God and to think about the eternal purpose and the big picture and what it's all about? And it's about Jesus Christ reconciling all things. And it's got to do with the fact that in the end, He's going to have full control both in His heavenly kingdom and earthly kingdom. It's all going to be gathered under Him. But where the body of Christ comes in is reigning in that heavenly kingdom. Well, I'm going to tell you this. You'll be there if you're saved, but you might be a janitor if you don't get with it. <laughs> Do you think it's all going to be the same in that kingdom? Look at, look at kingdoms on the earth now. Does everybody have the same position? No. Okay, you're going to have to realize that, yes, you're going to be there, and yes, you'll inherit the kingdom of God, but you're not going to reign like you could if you don't serve the Lord faithfully now. How you serve God as a Christian matters for time and eternity. Okay? So he said in Galatians 6, verse 6, Let him that is taught in the Word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. And that's talking about giving and receiving. That's what communication is talking about here. He says in Philippians 4, 15, with the word communicate, he talks about giving and receiving. Now notice, be not deceived. God is not mocked. You're not pulling one over on Him, okay? He's the judge, the righteous judge. His judgment is without respect of persons. It is thorough. You can't hide anything. I mean, you can be sitting in a church right now like this that believes the book and is trying to preach the gospel and teach the word rightly divided, but if your heart's not in it and, and you're, you're not sincere, you're wasting your time as far as God is concerned. He's going to make manifest the hidden counsels of the heart. I mean, it's got to do with the right motive. It's got to do with the reality of, the, of, what, it, of what it is. And God knows you're not going to mock God. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. The context here is giving to the work of the ministry. And if you give to support false doctrine, you're going to reap corruption because that's what false doctrine produces. But if you support sound doctrine, you're going to reap life of that because that's what sound doctrine produces when it's believed. What are you supporting? What, I mean, what are you investing in? And it's not just money, that's part of it, and that's actually what he's talking about here. But it has to do with giving your time and your efforts and, and giving yourself over to a greater cause than you. To the work of the ministry God's given us to do in this age of grace, He said, let us not be weary in well-doing. And sometimes you feel it, don't you? Don't you get tired of telling people and telling people and telling people and about 5% responding the way that you want them to respond? But you've got to keep going. God gives the increase. you just got to keep going. Let us, you know, let us not be weary and well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You quit, you faint, you go support a denominational system that's teaching bad doctrine, you're not going to, you are going to lose reward at the judgment seat of Christ, my friend. If, if you faint in doing what you're supposed to do, it's going to matter in that day. You're only going to reap if you faint not. If you, and one thing about the reward, I'll just go ahead and tell you now, it always comes down to faithfulness. That's the issue. Not results, faithfulness. Faithfulness. Instant, in season, out of season. There's too many roller coaster Christians, you know? Up one day, down another. I mean, look, be instant, in season, out of Just keep going and serve God and serve God and serve God and preach the gospel and teach the Word of God. And don't be so circumstance driven and feelings driven. Oh, I feel like serving God today, so I'm going to go do it. I don't feel like serving God today, so I'm not going to do it. No, you've got to be faithful. It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. He said this, as we have therefore opportunity, let's do good to all men, especially them who are the household of faith. We ought, to, we ought to help everybody we can, but there ought to be an emphasis on the household of faith. Look, please, in Philippians 4. I'm, t I'm trying to come to a close on this, but I've got to get this point across. Because here's the thing. You may not be the one up in the pulpit preaching the truth. But a man can't stand in the pulpit and preach the truth by himself and get the work done on his own. It has to be 
people receiving it and taking it out and giving it out and supporting it, and it takes the whole church working together, being laborers together with God. And so you don't have to be the one in the pulpit, okay? We are all ambassadors for Christ. And to me, the issue is you come here on a Sunday and, 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 and learn and then take that out with you and share it with someone else. Uh, this, what Paul said, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. If you can't go out those doors and talk about the Word of God rightly divided and minister to someone else, then you've not really learned it yourself. Okay? And by the way, you don't need to just come here to learn. You ought to learn every day on your own in the Word of God. But I'm just saying, God gave the church pastors and teachers for the work of the ministry and the edifying of the body of Christ. But you can support the work. Now, uh, he said in Philippians 4, verse uh, 14, Notwithstanding, you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. While he was a prisoner, they sent to comfort him and gave an offering to help him. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift. Now notice, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. What do you think he's talking about? Judgment seat of Christ. You're going to give an account. You, if you sow to a real Bible ministry, you're going to reap. And you ought to do everything you can personally, but when you help others that are doing things that you're not doing, you still have a part in that. You're partakers with them in that. One last place, 1 Timothy 6, and this will be it. 1 Timothy 6, we'll stop here. First Timothy 6, verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world. You say, who would that be? All of us. Do you know you're rich? If you don't think so, let's get on a plane, let's go over to the Philippines, or let's go down to Brazil, or let's go over to, uh, good night, go to Haiti. I mean, most places in this world you go to, you are rich compared to them. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. Don't put your trust in riches because the only certain thing about riches is we can't take them with us, and they can leave us before we even die. You can be like Job. Now, of course, he got more in the end, but I'm saying is he lost it all in one day, didn't he? Don't trust in riches. Trust in God. But in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. And that's not redistribution of wealth forced by the government. He said ready and willing. <laughs> ready and willing. If you're rich... Don't keep it to yourself. Support God's work. Okay? Notice that they do good and that be rich in good works. So the main thing is that you're rich in good works and then if you have riches, use that, distribute that, communicate that. Notice verse 19, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. What do you think that is? The judgment seat of Christ. Can you imagine, you know, he said, Lord, I didn't have anything to give to your work. And he says, well, I'm looking at this direct TV bill here. And uh, I'm looking at, uh, who, you, who are we kidding? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You better invest in eternal things. Okay? In other words, everything we do for this life, and it's all going to fade away. But he said, look, you're gonna, you need to lay up for yourselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, we have eternal life, but we better start acting like it. We better start acting like we're going to give an account of the judgment seat of Christ. You know when that can happen? How about today? That could happen today. And the issue is going to be your quality of work. And it's going to be how you're going to reap what you sow. Now, you reap in this life, by the way. There is a, there is a, a sense in which you will reap now.
but especially in that day of the judgment seat of Christ, how you sowed all your life in the work of the ministry, how you planted, how you watered, your faithfulness, you will reap for that. And if you spend all your time sowing to the flesh, your work will burn up. Because the flesh is wood, hay, stubble. But what you do in the Spirit, that's gold, silver, and precious stone. Now, here's the thing about it. You have Israel having a judgment and reward on the earth. You have the body of Christ having a judgment and reward in heaven. Now, when you look at the Bible in the New Testament, you're going to find passages on crowns in relation to Israel on the earth. You're also going to find those crowns in relation to the body of Christ in heaven. But what are those crowns? What does that mean for us in reigning in His heavenly kingdom? Uh, that's where we're going to try to pick it up, Lord willing, next time. Let's stand together, please.